All right, welcome everybody to the first to my eye lectures um, in 2022. It's a real pleasure today to have Jitendra Malik with us. Um, Jitendra is a professor at UC Berkeley and a research director at FAIR. So I guess it's fair to say that, you know, it's very difficult to make an appropriate introduction for Jitendra. I mean, he's he has reshaped the computer vision field from the last like two or three decades. And when other people talk about having awards um, for themselves, Jitendra is talking about having like tens, 20, 30 professors from his own PhD student pool right now who have their own awards. And I think this is probably, um, it's probably fair to say that, you know, Chandra, you're one of the luminaries in the last um, decade that has really defined the new era of computer vision and also um, is responsible for its outstanding impact in the, in the whole community. So we're very, very happy to have you here today. Um, and I think your talk is going to be about learning to walk um, with vision and proprioception. So we're happy to uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you, Matthias, and uh, welcome everybody and uh, happy new year. I think this is the first talk I'm giving in the new year and let's all hope that this is a year where we get to finally do things in person and uh, meet in person rather than just virtually. But for now, this is a virtual talk and uh, the benefit of that is that it, it's uh, not constrained by geography. So this talk uh, is about learning to walk with vision and proprioception. Now, I have spent most of my career in computer vision with some forays into graphics and machine learning, but uh, this talk is uh, mainly a robotics talk. And uh, so first I need to explain the context why I got into this, this era. So I think it's helpful to think about artificial intelligence as derived from natural intelligence. And uh, this slide is like a one slide history of biological intelligence, the evolution of it. So uh, we had uh, multicellular life about 540 million years ago in the so-called Cambrian explosion. And that's the first time that you have animals who can move and they uh, moving gives you an advantage because moving means that you can get food from various places. But then you need to know where you are going and you need to be to go towards the food, which means you need a vision system. So these two capabilities, the capability to locomote and the capability to perceive, these have to co-evolve. Either of them in, without the other are not so helpful. And uh, if, uh, uh, in the, if we move to sort of the 20th century, we, uh, there was the great psychologist Gibson who had this line, we see in order to move and we move in order to see. And uh, there's a book which goes into kind of this arms race here. And uh, for example, when there are animals can move, then some animals will be predators and others will be prey. Now this gives you an impetus to develop camouflage systems, which means that the predator has to develop an ever better vision system to break camouflage. Uh, if you have the ability to move fast to escape, well, then the predator has to be able to move even faster to be able to catch you and so on. So movement and perception, they really go hand in hand. And, uh, and this is the history of 500 million years of evolution. And when we get to the more recent years, like last say 10 million years or 5 million years, then you have the development of manipulation, the opposable thumb uh, tool use and so forth. And then if we talk about language and symbolic reasoning, that's much more recent, like 100,000 years. So my conjecture is that this is also central to the development of AI, that when we talk about language, it has to be grounded on a system which has sensory motor capabilities. And those are essentially at the confl confluence of perception and action. So my, most of my career, I worked on just perception in its own setting. So problems like object detection, recognition, or inferring 3D and so forth. But the last five years, I have uh, turned to robotics because I feel that that's the proof of whether our vision systems are any good. If we are, uh, vision can be used obviously for uh, manipulation, but also for navigating in environments, guiding locomotion and so on. So that's where I'm coming from and that's why uh, uh, this talk is actually a robotics talk, but from the sensibilities of a person who has grown up in perception. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about a walking robot and uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. 
or in the walking in this case. So I'll start with some videos and this is our robot in the real world. And this is actually the Berkeley Marina and uh, you know, and this is the robot in the real world. And this is not like one selected demo. Uh, here are many others, which, so this is going downstairs. And this robot, by the way, is uh, it's, uh, it's Unitree. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's called the A1 from Unitree. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fairly cheap robot. You can get this for $10,000, or in fact, there are versions which are now available for $3,000. And uh, okay, here are more demos. So this is uh, rubble. So the robustness of locomotion is exhibited in the robustness of the of walking in the presence of different kinds of environments where you have uneasy footholds and the like. Okay, so here is another setting. This robot, by the way, is blind. So even though I started off talking about the importance of vision, this robot is blind. And I will, in fact, talk about the development of our robot as first a blind robot and then a robot which can see. And this is important because we know that blind people can walk. So there is a certain capability of walking, which is driven by sensing, but the sensing is proprioception. Proprioception means knowledge about, for example, foot where your foot, when your foot collides with the ground, joint angles, muscle activations, and the like. Okay, so here's another example. So, so this is again meant to show that you can have very unsteady uh, footfalls and you, you should still be able to walk. Okay, walking should be able to be at different speeds. So we can walk, we can run. In the case of animals, they have gallops and trots and canters and so many of these other gates. And finally, here is a, a robot which is using vision. So what you see on the right is kind of the, the view from the camera. So there's a camera mounted on the head of the robot, which is a stereo camera, so it has depth. And uh, you'll now see it walk and it, it's all the computing is on, the, on board the camera and it is able to negotiate, uh, avoid obstacles. All it has been given is uh, some direction like go uh, you know, uh, 75 meters Northeast. And then it has to manage to walk without while avoiding obstacles. And that's what you see here. And uh, what you see in the bottom right is the view of the camera. And then above that, you see a map that is being built up. Okay. So, so this is this is sort of the research agenda. I'm going to talk about uh, a, a truly effective walking robot, which can work in a wide variety of environments, and it can do that with proprioception and with vision and the two together. And what's the challenge in this problem? The most challenging part here is to deal with variability. So from a computer vision point of view, what are we used to? We are used to variability in the shape of a particular object. So if I want to recognize cats, I have to recognize cats, even though they may be in different shapes, in different textures, colors, and so on, different articulation, I still have to recognize the cat as a cat. In the case of walking, we have to walk whatever be the terrain. It could be soft sand, it could be rocks and boulders, it could be planks. I have to walk in all of these circumstances. So that's where learning comes in, to be able to deal with a variety of environments. And then of course, this action is always driven by sensing and you have a variety of sensing, which is proprioception as well as vision. Now, the way I'm going to structure this talk is to, uh, to first uh, to start with ever more sophisticated robots. So there's going to be the simplest robot, the next one, the next one and so forth. And uh, let's uh, get going. And there are four versions of this. So the first version, this is, uh, this is uh, going to be uh, this is work that we published at the robotics uh, conference in July of 2021. And our uh, secret sauce here is something we call rapid motor adaptation. And I'm going to get into that. And this is joint work with my student Ashish Kumar, uh, Deepak Patak, who used to be at Berkeley, but now is at CMU and his student Zipeng Po. Okay, so what's the starting point? Well, the most obvious thing that somebody would in the 
2021 would say is, okay, there's a learning problem. Let's use reinforcement learning. Let's train the robot to walk. Okay, first order, that's the basic story. And this is easy, but how do you ensure that there is enough variety? Okay, so what we do is we uh, train this robot to walk in simulation and the terrain is very varied. So it's got these ups and downs. And the way you do this is by generating a fractal terrain. Okay, and then you use uh, standard reinforcement learning. In our case, it's PPO. Okay, so, so that's what we are gonna do. But now let me take you through the history of uh, work on robot walking. And actually we have to go back to the history in uh, biomechanics. So people who have been looking at animals walking. And uh, the people in biomechanics, what they've done is they've characterized different animal movements in terms of gates. So this is, so gates are periodic. So you have a periodic pattern of footfalls and what you need to, what you have in these different regimes of walking and trotting and galloping and so forth is different patterns of these footfalls. And that's, that was a classical story that people in uh, biomechanics had developed. Now let's look at uh, what happened in, uh, in the early days of AI and robotics and computer vision. So people thought, okay, that's what the biomechanics people do. So let's do the same thing. So we have these gates, which are characterized here by footfall patterns. So let me just explain. So LH means left hind leg, left front leg, right front leg, right hand leg. And then these solid circles are that the foot is on the ground and open circles are that it is in the air. Okay. And then you have these different patterns uh, of pace, of walk, See, in walk, you have many more times when the foot is on the ground than when it is trotting, where more of the times the foot is in the air, like the circles are open circles rather than. So this is uh, pioneering early work and that's totally understandable. Now this connected to ideas that people had in neuroscience and that's the idea of a central pattern generator. So think of a pattern. So when you think periodicity, what do you think of? You think of sine waves, cosine waves. Right, so you need some generator of sine waves and cosine waves. And if you're an electrical engineer or a neuroscientist, you'll imagine some circuit where there are some neurons which are firing and inhibiting each other. And as a result, some pattern of, some periodic pattern is being produced. And that's the concept of a central pattern generator. And these are ubiquitous in biology. And these are there in like fish swimming or birds flying or animals walking. So, so now people in computer vision and robotics, uh, they, they, there's this paper here, which is uh, how they, they try to came up, come up with circuits for doing that and how to use them in robots. <coughs> so going right along uh, is when you have sort of the first really successful uh, robot that walked in the real world, which was due to Mark Raybert. So Mark Raybert is subsequently the founder of Boston Dynamics and Many of you have probably seen videos of uh, the various robots from uh, their group. Uh, you know, Spot is the, their dog, for example. And, uh, and uh, uh, so the approach here is uh, classical control theory. So you're trying to model a gate and you try to construct a feedback loop which will stabilize the gate. And then there's a lot of uh, observations that people have made, which is that actually in normal walking, a lot of energy can be conserved. So even without, so even a passive system can do quite a bit of walking and there are toys around that and so forth. But anyway, this is the, the and this line of work has culminated in the demos that you can find in YouTube on, uh, on uh, from Boston Dynamics. Okay, and, uh, and of course that's the leading, that's the most famous uh, group, but of course there are many other groups and. Uh, MIT Mini Cheetah, RHEC, some of these are 10 years old. Uh, currently, uh, one of the really cool works is from ETH Zurich uh, called Animal and so on. Okay, so, uh, so what's the basic setup? The basic setup is uh, gates and designing control laws for gates. And then the most recent work has got into trying to uh, use reinforcement learning in this setup. And now let's look at what we know from biology. And uh, how do humans move in the real world? Okay, so at the top row shows some uh, toddlers learning to walk and move. 
And then uh, in the bottom row, I show many much more accomplished people, rock climbing and so on and so forth. Okay, and I want you to connect this, these observations of real people and real kids with this concept of gait, uh, trot, gallop, canter, and so on, which is very periodic, very systematic, and so forth. But is that actually true? So uh, we have, uh, we talk a lot with Karen Adolf, who's a psychologist who studies babies learning to walk. Uh, and she's a professor at NYU. And these are kind of her observations and uh, about how children learn to walk. And there's a lot of detail there, but I'm going to just show you this video, which is, so this, this girl is, uh, is uh, going to walk and observe the pattern, okay? Okay, so the, and, and now the same uh, movement, but now it's annotated. So S means sideways, F means front, B is back. So she moves sideways, front, 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 and then back, back. This is very typical. That, that, so this is the flexibility of the, of the movement system. It, so once you see that, then to me, it was obvious that I think structuring human movement in terms of gates is way too limiting. It's way too much more general. And uh, that's, that's how we should think about it. So our, we made a philosophical assumption. We will not program in gates. Okay. We are going to learn movement uh, ab initio. So that's our slogan, no pre-programmed gates. And this is like a distinguishing feature of our work. Okay, so then how do we do this? So, so therefore we are, uh, there's always this continuum between nature and nurture or in machine learning, it is how much you build in and how much do you let uh, emerge from the data or the learning. And this takes us closer to the uh, learn from the data or learn from your experiments in the real world side. So, so, uh, so what's the basic setup? The basic setup is there's a, there's a physics simulator. So this is uh, because you cannot do those those uh, billion trials in, uh, in the real world. So you do them in a simulator and you need to have good simulators. And, but those are available now, okay? And, uh, and what you are doing is planning your actions. So here X stands for the state. Okay, so there's a control theory people's terminology. They always use X, whereas in the uh, RL community, they'll use S. Okay, then there's the action A, which actually control people would use U probably. And uh, what the base policy is doing is that it has this access to the state. So the state is the various joint angles of the robot, the knowledge whether a foot is touching the ground. And then you plan uh, and then you move your foot, uh, feet, et cetera, et cetera. And then you judge whether the action is successful or not. So the goal is to be able to walk a certain number of steps. And uh, one twist, to this idea. So this is, this is like standard reinforcement learning, what you learn in the first few lectures of a class on reinforcement learning. Uh, the fact is that the environment can vary. And the question is where, you, where do you uh, allow that to come in? So the way the R setup is that we allow one of the arguments to the policy to be some encoding of the environment. Okay, so what do we mean by the environment? The environment could mean ca some characteristics of the robot as well as some external characteristics like the mass, uh, friction of the, which the feet are facing, terrain height, strengths of the motors and so on. So you, you see this list here. And, and now these can vary. And in fact, these will vary between the simulation and the real world version of the, uh, of the action. So this is why people in robotics talk about the sim to real gap, that when you train in simulation, uh, you may have something that works, but these parameters that you've used in simulation turn out not to be exactly the same for the real robot in the real world. Okay, so let's acknowledge that fact, but let's take these, these, these uh, all these uh, uh, features of the environment and then we encode them. So think of this like an auto encoder kind of style. So it's it reduced into some lower dimensional representation of the environment. And that's one of the arguments for the base policy. So the policy will change depending on 
you, you, you will issue different actions depending on whether the ground is slippery or not slippery and so forth. Okay, so we, we call this the extrinsics. Now at training time, you actually know this because in simulation, you have access to all this information. So sometimes people use the term privileged information. So at simulation time, you have access to all of this, whereas in the real world, some of this information like friction and so on is not directly measurable. Okay, then in your reinforcement learning, you, I think of it as just a way to do optimal control. So optimal control is a classic topic in you know, electrical engineering and applied math. And uh, the idea is that you have sequential decisions to make, and then there is some cost function that you're trying to minimize. And the cost function, the most obvious term is that you should obviously be moving forward. But in addition, we have other terms which make for smooth movement, such as you want to do minimal amount of work. You don't want to use up too much energy. You want to minimize your ground impact. You don't want to be banging your feet hard. It is all sensible. These are constraints which would be there in evolution. And, uh, and that's it. And then nothing else is programmed. No gate is programmed. And then we can train the, train the, the robot to walk. And this is what emerges after it has trained for a certain amount of time. Okay. So that's, this is Stanford. Everything I've done so far, there's nothing very exciting or novel. And now let's talk about the problem of making it walk in the real world. Okay. So how do we take that robot we have trained in simulation and make it walk in the real world? Because now I no longer have access to this information like friction, uh, exact information about the center of mass, the motors may have changed over time and so on. Now, uh, so people call this the sim to real problem. Now here is the insight. It's actually not, the problem is worse than that. It's not just about going from simulation to reality. The problem is about going from reality to reality. So think about we humans. We can walk, uh, we can walk on a regular pavement. We can walk when we are hiking, we can walk on sort of this kind of ground. Or if I go to the beach, then I'm walking in sand. And then when I, and each of these needs a slight variation of my walking strategy. In fact, yesterday I saw an article in the New York Times, which was about advice on how people should walk on ice because uh, a lot of falls happen when uh, people are walking on ice and then they break their hips and it's a bad situation. So really we are always adapting, okay? It's just like we can't have a template for object recognition because there is no, there is no one template for a cat, they are variable. Similarly, there cannot be one template for walking. You have to deal with all the variability. So in fact, there's a real to real uh, situation. So that's what motivates what we call rapid motor adaptation. So basically we need some process by which we can very quickly adapt. If I'm walking on pavement and then I start walking on sand, my walking system should adapt. And that adaptation has to be very quick because you can't take uh, minutes to adapt because in a, a walking is the period time period of walking is like a second or two, right? You think of uh, how many steps you take in a second. So it has to adapt on the order of a fraction of a second. If it can't adapt in that, it's of no use in the real world. And in the initial version, I should be able to do it blind. Later on, I will make use of vision. So that's the setup. So how can we do that? So this is our basic policy, uh, which I, we, we want to deploy. And uh, the policy essentially gets, uh, the way it is, uh, it has access to the internal state. It has access to the immediate past history of actions and you use that to command the next action. So how should I think about that? The next action is basically the states of all the joints. That's what I'm trying to do. I have a desired state of the, all the, the joint angles. And uh, this loop may be running at like 100 Hertz. And then from those joint angles, there can be a low level PID controller, which uh, uh, you know, gives commands to the motors and so forth. But our challenge is that, that this, uh, this, this information, which was available in simulation for the mass friction and so on is what was 
compressed down to this uh, z sub t vector, which kind of captured the environment and was an argument for the policy. This is unknown, and uh, this information is unavailable at uh, in the real world. So how are we going to get it? So uh, so think about how humans get this information. So I'm so imagine I'm blind. I was walking on a hard ground, and then I start walking in the sand. What's going to happen is that I'm going to put my foot down. And then when I lift it up, and if I apply the same force that I did before, my foot will not rise as much because I'm in a surface where my foot has sunk in. So I will, let's say I command the same actions, but the results in the real world are slightly different. And I have access to that. So I always have access to my history of commanded actions and the actual state. So, so this is my clue. So this, this, uh, so that, that's what I'm going to do. I need to use that to estimate these parameters online. Okay. So let's get into this. So we'll call this the adaptation module. So now imagine that you have your basic policy. Which, uh, which takes as one of its arguments, the environmental conditions. So this will vary for friction and sand and hard ground and all the rest of it. But at simulation time, I had access, uh, ground truth access to this information. But when I'm walking in the real world, I don't have access to this. So we have this so-called adaptation module and this adaptation module is going to try to estimate these parameters. And the way it's going to try to estimate them is by, it has to do it online and it does it online from the past history. So I have my history of the, my past 50 actions, what action I commanded and what state I achieved. And this adaptation module is going to try to, uh, to estimate this. And then of course, once it has this, this estimate of what the extrinsics are, then, then we can keep executing this uh, policy and the situation has been reduced to the same as the case in simulation. Now, now the challenge becomes, how do I train this adaptation module? So something like this goes on in human vision too, right? We are always adapting. So how, to, and then adaptation is based on your immediate past history. Okay, so the signal is the discrepancy between the expected movement and the actual measured movement. And then we, we are continuously estimating this, this uh, Z T. Okay. Okay. And here's the cool part. This adaptation module can also be treated as a machine learning problem. Okay. Now uh, we are now in territory, which in classical control theory is called adaptive control and so on. But our setup is like this. So we first train this basic policy. Okay. The base policy, which is shown here. And I described that. So PPO in a simulation environment. And now this adaptation module is also trained in simulation. And uh, what it is, is it's just like a simple neural network, multi-layer perceptron, which has access to the past 50 time steps of history of the state and the actions that you commanded. In neuroscience, this is called the efference copy. What did I command? And then what actually happens may not be exactly that. And but how can we train this? We can train this in simulation because in simulation, you actually have access to privileged information. So you actually know what these mass uh, uh, and uh, center mass and friction and all of these parameters are. So we had first, uh, so we had got this vector of extrinsics Z sub T, which originally arose just as an encoding of the environment features. And these were known. But now in the second phase, we, take away this privileged information and we try to train to regress to this as the target using the immediate past history. And now this is just a simple supervised learning problem. And that's what the adaptation module is doing. The adaptation module is creating some kind of a proxy of this external uh, situation. And that's it, that's the core idea. And now at test time, we can, we don't have access to privileged information. So we have a base policy, which is running at 100 Hertz. That's the one which is basically determining the walking. And then one level above, kind of a, like a meta level, 
you have a uh, you have a a procedure which is a simple neural network which has access to the immediate past history of the robot's actions and achieved states, which is being used to estimate the ESFT. And that's that's what we run at uh, in deployment. And, and this is the secret of our success. So we, we have been able to create one policy to work in all of these situations, all these different environments that I showed, it's exactly the same policy. Now the pattern, of footfalls and so on has to be different. So the way it is becoming different is because this of this adaptation module, which is in real time, in like half a second, uh, estimating this Z sub T, which is one of the arguments to the policy, and then obviously the actions taken are different. So now let me just show you some more results. So, uh, so here's an example of this adaptation module. So, uh, so here's a slippery surface. You can see that there's a plastic sheet, okay? And uh, Ashish, uh, he, what he's going to do is he's actually going to pour olive oil on the sheet, which makes it extra hard, okay? And now this uh, our robot dog has to walk on the surface. And then in addition on this feet, you put some uh, plastic shoes. Okay, so notice what happens. So the friction is, as I suddenly become much lower. So the robot starts to slip, right? And then it recovers. So let's see the thing again. Starts to slip and then it recovers. Okay, so, uh, so how's that encoded? So essentially what's gonna happen is that this adaptation module over this period of half a second is going to try to use the sequence of states and actions to estimate this, this extrinsic uh, vector, which in our case is like an eight dimensional vector Z. So look at as the, so now I'm going to run this. Uh, so in this video at the top, you see the pattern of footfalls, right, left, uh, leg, uh, right, rear, front, le uh, left, front, rear, uh, right, okay. And then uh, this Z1 and Z5 are two of the eight dimensions of this vector. And uh, notice that what will happen is that as the, uh, the robot starts to slip, the estimate of these parameters will change. So, uh, so let's uh, observe that. So now, uh, because of this change in the history, the parameters uh, Z, Z1 and Z5, and there are eight of these, these have been estimated as different. And the, the policy gets this as an argument, so it will, uh, put have a different pattern of uh, how to move, move the feet. Here's another example. And here what's being done is, uh, is uh, that you drop a weight on the robot. So this is the slow-mo version. So what's happening is now, it, this is like a very big weight because it's like a five kg weight on an eight kg robot. So suddenly it's like its back is shrunk down and then, but then it recovers. So how does the recovery happen? Again, it's happening through the estimation, this fast adaptation, which is happening because those are being estimated. So look at the, the Z2, Z7. So these are different dimensions of this, uh, different components of this eight dimensional vector. So it keeps walking and now, there is this adaptation phase where it figures out that the environment has changed and then the actions change. And uh, we, can now, uh, uh, we can now compare our system with and without this adaptation module. And uh, this is the system with, without, uh, with the adaptation module, so it's perfectly okay. If we remove this adaptation module, so you are using a fixed, policy throughout, the same policy is being used all the time, then this is what happens. Okay. And here's another example. Uh, so so our, the, our default system uh, uh, and, and the system with adaptation. So the adaptation system is on the top and at the bottom, you don't do any adaptation. So top is fine. So this is, uh, Okay, false. And uh, uh, this robot comes with its own built-in controller. 
and uh, you can compare against that. And uh, this is the their controller. And this is ours. And uh, I think more examples, but let me skip this. Uh, let's see. <coughs> okay, I think I'll move past beyond this. So uh, anyway, I hope you're convinced that there's a wide variety of uh, situations in which it can work. And here are more careful experiments. So I think I, I want to spend a little bit of time on these experiments because this pro area problem of uh, sim to real has been known for years and what are other people's approaches. So one approach is what's called domain randomization, which is that at training time, you do a lot of variation in the conditions and then the robot has to walk under all of these conditions. So the idea is one controller, uh, which is working in all conditions and you just have an enough variation at training time. So this is like the computer vision philosophy of like data augmentation. You do tons of augmentation and you hope that it works in all of these conditions. So that's the, the first idea. And, uh, and, uh, and then there are, there's another approach, which is that you could try to do the classic control theory thing identify the system, system identification. You try to estimate friction, mass, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a third approach here, which is uh, trying to adapt in real time from your trajectories in the real world. And uh, of course, the best you can do is if you knew the privileged information right away, and that's the best. But what we find is that our strategy can get almost as good with this, uh, this uh, dynamic adaptation as having access to privileged information. And it is much better than the classic domain randomization approach, which is at 62%. So what's going on is that it's, I think in the, if a computer vision people, I will use the idea of invariance and equivariance. You can build in invariance, which means that you, it, the recognition works for whatever be the pose. Equivariance is that you, rec you, you are making use of the fact that there can be different poses and, and you build that in. So our approach is kind of similar to the equivariance philosophy, okay? That you estimate the pose and you use that and make a better, uh, you make a better detector or a better walker than to say exactly the same policy under all circumstances. System identification, which is the classic uh, approach from control theory is trying to solve too hard a problem because it may, there may be 30 parameters, but actually you don't need to know all of them this reduced subset, uh, the, which you can think of as kind of a nonlinear PCA of it, is easier to estimate and that's good enough. And fine tuning at test time is simply not feasible because you need to adapt very quickly. And here are some more numbers, but I gave you the basic intuition here. Okay, uh, so this was four-legged walking, but we, these ideas work across the board not just by the way for walking, but for manipulation. But here I'm going to show you a two-legged walking, which is considered a more challenging problem. And uh, because two legs is more unstable system and here, here's a demo of that. Okay, now I'm going to go into uh, uh, how, how we actually get this to walk at different speeds. So in the reinforcement learning, you specify a target speed, you say, go at one meter per second or go at 1.5 meters per second. And that's it. Every, you can just train it with different target speeds. And uh, so that's for different linear velocities. And then you can also train for different angular velocities. So you can get the robot to rotate and turn and so on. So, so that part is just variation in the training, just train at different, for different uh, speeds. And here is what we observe. What we observe, so that's it. Simply retrain the policy to track different speeds. And here is what we observed, okay? So we give it different target speeds, 0.375 meters per second, 0.9 meters per second, and so on. And what we got was something very cool, which is that the robot walks in with different gates at different speeds. So this is like the slow walk. 
And uh, what you see at the bottom are the footfall patterns, which foot is on the ground. Okay, so this is the a trot. And this is uh, like a gallop. So the front feet are moving together, back feet are moving together. So this classically would be programmed in as gates. In our case, the gates just emerge. We didn't have to program them in. So why did we get different gates? And, uh, and this is a paper we had at uh, Coral. Uh, and there's a simple answer, which is that it's about energy consumption. So when you, I mean, for animals in the real world, when you move around, you spend a lot of your time, you know, running uh, to, cap to capture other prey or escape from prey and so on. So you want to be energy efficient. So you will use different gates at different speeds because they are more efficient or less efficient at different speeds. Okay. And we had built that in, in the sense that our uh, loss function, the, uh, the reward, it was very natural to just say, you try to minimize the energy that you consume. And, uh, and then uh, here is some work on horses, which showed that what they did was they measured the energy consumption of the horse by putting some bag and measuring the oxygen consumption and so forth. And then what they found was that in different regimes at different speeds, different gates are energetically optimal. So walk, trot, gallop, and so on. And this is a nature paper from 1981. And we get exactly the same kind of behavior, okay? Of that at, in different regimes, it, with, at different target speeds, different gates are chosen by the, the reinforcement learning procedure, which has as one of the terms in the cost minimizing energy automatically gives rise to different gate patterns. And then we have compared this and uh, uh, yeah. And the cool part is that when you don't pre-program the gates, you can have a variation in gate in a continuous fashion. And, and the gates adapt to different terrains because of course this RMA is running all the time. So here there's a dip in the terrain and it, uh, it works through this. So it's, it's pretty robust because a human is pulling with this, uh, this uh, rope. Okay, so here what we are doing is we're making this robot walk and we are giving it a sequence. We're telling it that go at 1.5 meters per second for some time, then at 0.7, then at 0.3, that kind of thing. And uh, it will keep changing its gait as needed. That's it. The high level command is just uh, what velocity should you go at. Okay, and uh, it can adapt to unstable footholds because there's at the adaptation route, routine working all the time. Okay, so now, uh, so that's my version three. So this was basically, I think the big novel insight was in the adaptation stage to go at different different gates, we didn't have to do anything. We just give different target speeds and the rest happens. So the same, it's emergent to use that term. Now I'm gonna to turn to how, uh, how to move with using vision. So we were using proprioception so far. So far the robot was blind. But if I want to walk through these obstacles, well, I clearly need vision. And uh, so what's the starting point? So the starting point is that there's been a lot of work in wheeled uh, robot navigation. So the classic answer is you do slam, you build a map, and then you walk through it, right? Those are ideas which go back, you know, Sebastian thrown and go like 20 years ago. But there are more modern methods where you are actually not building the full map. You are, uh, you are building the map on the fly and you can uh, still navigate. And there is point goal navigation is the example I'm going to take where you are told I'm at a certain position and you're told to go 200 meters Northeast. And uh, there's work from our group and many other groups on this topic. And to some extent it's regarded as a solved problem, uh, mobile robot navigation in the presence of obstacles. Walking gives you some more possibilities and interesting things. In fact, I believe that at the robot of the home has to be a walking robot because a walking robot can deal with stairs Walking robot can deal with clutter. 
So it's going to be more robust than uh, just a wheel robot, but that's my conjecture. And uh, for example, with a legged robot, if there's some obstacle, you can just walk over the obstacle. If there's stairs, you can walk on them. Okay, then, so navigation should be coordinated with locomotion. And then vision should be coordinated with proprioception because I have, I have the state of the body, which I know from joint angles, and I have uh, my vision system. So this is a paper which you can find on archive right now, uh, coupling vision and proprioception. And let me show you some results. So what's the basic setup? So we now have a robot and now we have mounted a camera on the head. So the head here has got a little camera here. Okay, this guy, this is an Intel RealSense camera. And this is basically an RGBD camera so it can build a local, a local depth map. Okay, so, the, uh, so we can just run the previous policy. We have a basic policy, we have an adaptation module. And what we need to do is we need to command for this robot, the linear velocity V sub T, which is what direction should it be going at what speed? And then the angular velocity, and that's because it needs to rotate to avoid obstacles. And this must be derived from perception. So that's what vision does. Vision is a distance sense. So vision enables you to spot the obstacles, figure out where the goal is, and figure out the strategy in terms of what direction to go and what to rotate. And note that this is in continuous space, so everything is very smooth and continuous. <coughs> so some, some, some details. So let's say I have, uh, uh, so, uh, so I have uh, the map as I'm building on the fly. So I actually don't have access to the full top-down view. All I have access is to what the robot sees on the fly. It will keep building a map as it goes along. And from which you can have a map of where are the obstacles and where's free space. And then you can use this fast marching method. This is work from uh, James Sethian, people who are into differential equations and, and so forth know all this work. The it's connected to the Iconal equation. And, uh, and that essentially gives you uh, a, a cost which gives you kind of the, the geodesics in this space. And we can use that to generate velocity commands and then we, we just keep moving. Okay. So, so that's the, the straightforward way. So what you see at the bottom right is the map seen by the, is the front view of the camera and the depth there. And what you see above that is the map as it is being built. So there is no complete map, but the map is being built up, uh, uh, built up on the fly. Okay. And uh, so it is able to negotiate through these obstacles. Okay, so this seems more or less straightforward, but then there are a couple of twists here. Okay, so the twists are, uh, let, let me tell you where the subtleties come in. So at what speed should you go? So we should go faster when we are in open space and more slowly when we are near obstacles, right? Because you're, there'll be errors and you want to avoid hitting against things. So that's one obvious thing to do. And then vision is not perfect you can have obstacles that your visual system misses. And, uh, and uh, so how do we deal with that? We, this happens to us, right? We are walking and then there's some, some, something lying on the ground and I don't notice it. And then my foot collides with it, but then I realize and I walk around it. So that's another ability we need. So, so here's a simple way to think about how to modulate your speed uh, based on what your vision system is telling you. So as this robot starts to walk, it, if you noticed, it slowed down, right? We, you, we slow down when we are walking on ice. We slow down when we are on stable ground. And it's pretty easy. What you can do is you can train a system which predicts the probability of a fall, which is a proxy for being unsteady. And when you have a higher probability of a fall you slow down, then the probability of a fall will decrease and so on. So that's the that's basic idea. So navigation can be coordinated with locomotion. Okay, here's an example of when the vision system can fail. So this robot, so what's happened here? It's because it's a glass door 
and uh, a transparent surface is not uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem the your rgbd sensor doesn't capture it so you have an obstacle but the vision system doesn't know it but you do know about it because you banged against it and you are unable to move so your proprioception system has access to this and so if you use that information you can plan a path around it and that's what you see here so so uh, so the the introduction of vision on top of this basic system required these these two tricks so one is predicting the fall of ability uh, likelihood of fall and using that as a way to generate uh, safe velocity com uh, commands because the robot can move at different speeds and you want it to move at the right speed and the second is that when you have uh, detect collisions the, those are giving you information that should be incorporated into the map and that's what you see here the collision detection gives you information which is about local occupancy and that goes into the map the incremental map being built note by the way that all the computing is on board nothing is being sent anywhere there is no prior knowledge built in of the environment everything is being sensed on the fly online by this robot and and so here you see some systems which is this is a uh, vision and proprioception and first there's only vision so this guy comes and quickly stands in front and maybe because his pants are black it can't uh, the the vision fails but proprioception will not fail and so therefore it has a revised map and so it plans a new path around it here are some outdoor environment So you notice that it's uh, avoiding obstacles and uh, the only pre-programming is that it has to go to us in a certain direction at, at so many meters away. So notice it's walking faster because it's on empty ground. And the vision system is much more liable to get stuck because uh, if the vision fails in any way, you're, probably you're stuck. And there are more examples of sort of application of these. So collision detection leads to an adjustment in the map, which leads to walking. So notice some things they didn't we didn't have to deal with at the visual planning stage we didn't have to deal with how to deal with this plank on the floor because that is already dealt with by the basic motor adaptation module To see if there's something cool at the end or not. Okay. And then we have all these experiments and simulation which show the value of using both vision and proprioception. But if you want, you can read them in the archive paper. And we have these experiments both in simulation and in the real world. And uh, uh, I'm going to conclude with this. Uh, this is my last slide. And uh, this is a statement of philosophy again. So going back to the 1980s, which of course, most of the people in the audience were not doing research in the 80s, but uh, there are a couple of papers from there which were very influential for me. One is work from Valentino Breitenberg. He, is, uh, he was in, uh, at uh, MPI in Tübingen not far from where you guys are. And he, had, he was a neuroscientist who had these designed these vehicles, which were little control loops where some sensor is being connected to some actuator. And uh, 
And he showed that these vehicles exhibited behavior which you might call fear, aggression, so on and so forth. Also in that era is work from Rod Brooks, who was at uh, MIT at the time, and he was building mobile robots with these layers. And the idea was that there are early layers like just obstacle uh, avoidance based on sonar and then higher layers which are based on vision and so forth. But in Brooks's times, he had to engineer everything. What we have done is we have taken these ideas of layered architecture, which I think are very good and solid, but combined them with the promise of deep learning. In this case, it's deep uh, reinforcement learning. And basically this gives us a way of combining, getting robust movement in the real world with the combined use of vision and proprioception. Uh, thank you for your attention. Cool, yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot. Um, very interesting. So I guess um, we actually have a lot of questions um, already in YouTube, but I guess everybody here on uh, on Zoom can ask some questions first. I guess, Cecilia, you were, you were one of the first ones to raise the hand. No? Oh, no, that's clapping. That's not raising the hand. I see. I got it. <laughs> um, oh, no, Tara has a question. Okay, maybe you can start first. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so I have a question about the rapid uh, motor adaptation. So uh, you mentioned that whenever the environment is changing in the real time, so it's, it's quickly adapt to the changed environment. Now, my question is, is there any assumption uh, between the how much is the change? Like, is there any uh, threshold that uh, if, if the change is within this threshold or within this limit, then only it's going to work? And if it is beyond that threshold, then it's going to fail or something like that? Well, uh, uh, so how does it adapt to the different situations? Because there has to be enough variety in simulation, right? Mm -hmm. So what's important is that it should have seen some proxy of that variety in simulation, right? Mm -hmm. And, and therefore, in simulation, it knew how to deal with that combination of uh, that, those environmental parameters. And now, in, when it's really moving in the real world, it has to estimate and then say, OK, I'm going to use uh, my policy will now be modified because of, uh, because of the, this estimate of the parameters. So in control theory, they, they have this idea of an observer which is using the output of the system to try to estimate something, right? Because you don't mm -hmm. have access to the full state. It's the same concept, except that it's a nonlinear observer and with a neural network, and it has been trained with supervised learning in simulation. But if you get a situation in the real world, which is completely outside, quote, the convex hull of what it saw in simulation, then this will mm -hmm. fail. So we need to have enough variety in simulation. Yeah. Now, okay. we don't need to have mm -hmm. exactly the same situation in simulation because these various parameters can trade off with each other, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, in, uh, so I think of it as metamers. So in computer vision, we have in color vision, we know that there can be two different colored lights which project to the same RGB outputs, mm -hmm. right? In physics, we have situations which are captured by these various numbers in fluid flow, Reynolds number, Prandtl number, Froude number. And what happens is that there are certain trade-offs and there are certain combinations of these parameters which are dimensionless constants. And so long as that takes a certain value, it's the same situation. Mm -hmm. So that is what is going on. So when these extrinsics are this reduced representation and, uh, and so long as the situation, there was a situation in simulation which in this reduced representation is identical to what you're seeing in the real world now, mm -hmm. then the approach will work. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Alex? Hi, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, I think it's in a similar vein, uh, and I wanted to ask you, you see Boston Dynamics sometimes with malicious actors perturbing the robot, and I would imagine that uh, if you have the walking simulation only, that you wouldn't have uh, a case for that. So do you um, uh, simulate malicious actors as well, like poking the robot, or is this just for the terrain? No, we, uh, we showed, uh, so some of those things are actually, they look impressive, but they are not that impressive because 
classical control approaches always are designed for robustness to error, right? So if I poke the robot, I'm causing some error because its position is no longer where it is. And the control law is supposed to recover from that because there is the, the desired state and then you measure an error and you correct for that. So it's really in a way that concept is just the concept of control. Now we have the same story here. Now I showed you those examples of uh, dropping a mass on the robot and the mass was quite significant because it was five kg and the robot is eight kg. Uh, so it's kind of a similar situation here. Now, uh, now in con control, there, there are two different ways of thinking about how you correct for errors. One is that you think of errors as unmodeled and whatever be the error, you're trying to map it to zero. And that can be effective for some range, small errors, that's the thing you want to do. But when the errors are large, then I'm saying that they are not random. And I'm going to kind of build a model of that error or not error, it's a disturbance. It's like in vision, we talk about Gaussian noise versus clutter. Most of the time we actually have to deal with clutter rather than Gaussian noise. And clutter can often be other objects. So it's actually systematic. So this is the philosophy we are adopting here that actually the, the nature of the disturbance or the is more can actually be modeled rather than just treated as random noise. And that's what Great. we are doing with this estimation of Z. Thank you. Pablo, I guess you were next. Thanks, Jitendra. Great talk. Um, <clears throat> um, building on top of this question the, the about like how will the robot will behave in new environments? Uh, you mentioned that it has to, the robot has to have seen something similar uh, before <clears throat> uh, in simulation. Do you guys are working like on this fine tuning that you also at some point mentioned like of the, of the model, like fine tuning or simulating online, like suddenly, suddenly you feel that you change terrains and you wanna like quickly simulate that somehow a, a little bit and then like, yeah. In order not to yeah, no, so, so this is actually happening at training time. So that's the advantage of this fractal terrain generator. This but terrain is always changing. So, uh, so because with a fractal, you have ups and downs, and these are undulations can be big or small. And it's like an infinite terrain, but on this infinite terrain, you have infinite variety. As it keeps walking, it's, it's now got maybe a drop which was 10 centimeters, or maybe now the drop is. 25 centimeters and so on. So it's always having to adapt. And we are also changing parameters like friction, parameters like the mass of the robot, the center of mass. So we are basically always subjecting this robot in simulation to constant change, both the physical geometry, as well as friction, as well as mass and so forth. So it has to adapt to all of this and it gets like a billion trials over which it sees all that variety. So you kind of consider that during your simulation, your first training on the simulation, you see everything. It's not that yeah. suddenly it goes to Mars and then terrain is like completely no. different. The idea is that in simulation, it's seen everything, but not, but everything in this metamorph sense, it's not, the, the environment may not be exactly the same. So it never saw sand, we'd never modeled sand, but maybe there was some place where there was a combination of friction and and uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of a motor strength, which was kind of like being in strength sand because the motors are weaker and there's uh, high friction that's equivalent to walking in sand. So, mm -hmm. so they will not be exactly the same situation, but it will be a proxy for it. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, I was just like trying to think of these like con continuous training but in as you're saying like you do have it already like you have the simulation running you could have it running even while the robot is deployed in real life and yeah. it keeps improving in theory um since you're seeing like more and more environments so yeah it makes yeah. sense cool thanks okay Trong, i guess you are next yeah thank you for your presentation yeah um uh, i have some question so in the pre, uh, some slides before you, um, I saw that um, the update rate of the basic policy it is much higher than the update rate of the rapid motor adaptation. If I remember, the, the base policy has the rate of 100 hertz and the RMI has the rate of uh, 10 hertz. So may I ask, uh, 
why why that is the case oh, well it's uh, it uh, it makes sense in the following way so first why 100 hertz your basic policy you want to run at the highest rate possible right so it's basically determined by your compute and if you have whatever onboard compute you have you try to run at the best possible rate because because it's really moving in continuous time and you're trying to do a discrete approximation. So you always want the highest rate possible. So 100 Hertz is what is feasible for us given the computing power of the onboard chip. So that is set by that. Yeah. The, 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 the adaptation operates at a slower rate. It has to operate at a slower rate because the adaptation has to observe some past history, okay? And then it makes, it needs that for estimation. So, so how am I going to figure out, for example, that I'm in sand? I put my foot down and then I lift it up and it doesn't lift up as much. So what's the time scale over which that will happen? That won't happen in 0 0.001 of a second. That's gonna happen in like 0 0.2 second, 0 0.3 second. So we are actually observing this history over a certain amount of time, and only then do you have enough data that that you that you can actually estimate the these extrinsic parameters. So so that part has to be roughly like half of a of a gate cycle, something like that. So therefore, the time intervals are going to be 0.3 second, 0.5 second, 0.2 second on that order. Otherwise, you just don't have enough data. So I mean, we are also limited by compute, but Basically, if you do it with a very fast clock rate, you will actually not be able to solve the estimation problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I also about to ask if uh, we increase the, the rate, so does the if performance better? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so for, for the first loop, the base policy, you want it to be as fast as possible. You have more compute, you just run it at 1000 Hertz, whatever, always good. The, the adaptation policy is like, it's like when you're fitting a line, you have some points and you're going to do regression, right? You, you need enough data to get the regression, right? And so therefore you need to observe the behavior for a certain amount of time for that to work. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I guess you had a question. Yeah, I guess maybe a bit following along this, um, I'm curious about what you see as the role of vision and proprioception in the sense that there were, I think it seems like vision is largely being used in the, the last system for obstacle navigation, but potentially could be also leveraged um, for anticipation. So like uh, before actually stepping in the sand, um, already maybe taking a more cautious gait because there's a change in, in the terrain that can be seen. Uh, exactly. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. So basically, so since I'm giving the talk now, I have four versions of the robot. And if you invite me six months from now, I will have version five and then I'll have a version six. And those five and six versions are exactly going to be using vision for long range planning. And let me sketch some of the examples. So, uh, so basically uh, I, can, I, I can learn the different kinds of terrains visually. I can recognize sand. I can recognize some oily surface, right? And that's what we do as humans. I recognize ice. So as a human, when you walk onto ice, you start walking differently. You don't <laughs> walk for, for two seconds and then fall. And then, you know, you, you won't take that risk. You'll see, recognize that it's snow and you'll recognize that. So, but we believe that these systems can be coupled together, right? So you can use one as providing the supervision for the other. So, uh, I mean, computer vision, self-supervision is like the hot thing. But another version of self-supervision is cross-modal supervision, where one modality supervises the other, like audio can supervise video and vice versa. Well, think in that kind of way. We can have some of your past experiences help guide your visual system. So the first time you go on sand, yes, you have this, uh, you will let your proprioceptive system, like when I was a kid, I don't know when I first went to a beach, right? Then it was new. But after that, I, I know how I start walking differently in anticipation. So that's one area. Uh, second area is really uh, planning uh, even uh, where, where your footfalls are. 
for example. So suppose uh, imagine that I'm trying to cross a river and there's water flowing and there are some stones and I'm going to jump over on those stones and cross the river, right? So there is data that people in psychology, uh, psychologists have collected about where do we look when we are walking? So, uh, so Mary Hayhoe has these experiments which show that when the terrain is difficult, we look closer to ourselves. When the terrain is easy, we look further away. If you are going on a hiking on a mountain trail, for example. So these things need to be there. I mean, there's similar data on driving. Like we drive, when we are driving, we look like three seconds away. But if I'm at slow speeds, that three seconds is nearer. When I'm at fast speeds, that is higher. So you're, uh, I totally agree with what you said and we are working on it. And I hope that in a few months we'll have results. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Let me actually ask one last question. I'm, I'm curious on a, on a high level, how, how much and at what abstraction do we actually need computer vision, right? I mean, you could just feed an image into a reinforcement learning system, but you could also run a bounding box detector, object detection, terrain classification. How, how much do we need these inter intermediate vision tasks? Like what's your gut feeling? Yeah, so th that's a fair question. And uh, what we did was uh, we actually are using a fairly high abstraction here. like. Yeah, the, we are using this Intel RGBD camera. So that's already uh, working at the level of a depth map. Okay. Okay, but so, you don't do any so, bounding box detection also, uh, right? So it doesn't have bounding, but but uh, yeah. So I I feel, and then you gave the example of this, uh, this uh, terrain classification, which would be at images. So my belief is that it is not just images. I mean, I have other papers on this topic. So I'm pushing a certain philosophy which is, I, I think the truth is somewhere in between. So there is the one extreme that classical robotics had. Classical robotics said, you recognize an object, you determine it six degree of freedom pose, and then you do stuff with that, right? Then there is the, 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 the extreme of RL, which is pixels to talks, you know, deep mind, uh, you know, the uh, Atari games, et cetera. That's this other extreme. And I'm somewhere in the middle actually. And where exactly, I will determine experimentally. And uh, uh, I, I, from, there are papers from my group from uh, last couple of years which show that actually their intermediate points are better because you generalize more, more uh, better by, with intermediate representation. To me, this is the $64 million question. What are the right intermediate representations? As a computer vision person, I've spent my lifetime trying to build those intermediate representations. So if it turns out that all robotics can be done just from pixels, right? I will feel, okay, I'll have to accept it, but I will be unhappy. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I believe that by now we have enough experimental evidence that their, their intermediate representations are good. They enable transfer. So they are good for multiple tasks, which I think is an important thing because the ability to, to work in some new setting with very little data for that is important if we can do generic training. And I feel that we have uh, experimental evidence supporting that, but that's like a whole another talk. But I mean, it's interesting. I mean, even if we're talking about things like SLAM, building up maps, do we need to do that as a kind of yeah. a black box reinforcement learning? No, so I, I'm, I'm no longer a believer in SLAM. So I will go one as, as drop, below slam but not all the way to just pixels okay i see okay now it's yeah. gonna i think it's gonna be really interesting because for the computer vision community that's a big question right like what what research should we work on to make this kind of stuff work but in practice yeah i think we the, the one of so this is one of the reasons why i got into robotics because i wanted to we i because i spent 35 years of my life just building these representations and hoping that somebody on the other side will use them. And sometimes the consumer is humans, right? If you just want to declare uh, that is it a cat or a human because you want to see something pretty in graphics, right? That's fine. But I, to me, the ultimate, one of the ultimate uses is robotics. So I decided that I really need to work in robotics to, to figure out what, is, uh, what actually helps. Cool. All right. I think we're already a little bit over. Um, thanks so much. Um, uh, thanks also for everybody joining on, on YouTube. Um, I'm going to end the stream right now. I hope to see everybody else in the next and upcoming weeks. 
we will have more talks. Um, and so far, um, this was the first one, and we were very happy to have you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it's been a pleasure. Okay.